Brian McCoward, and this is Bob Allen, and we're going to be uh, giving a talk that we retitled App Engine and Dubious and New Google APIs. Oh my. Um, so, I'm Nick Howard. Uh, I'm an avid Rubyist. Uh, um, Dubious is one of the open source projects that I can contribute to, so I'm going to be talking a bit about that. Um, I'm Broke Bobcat on Twitter and uh, pretty much everywhere else. And I work at GNIP in Boulder, Colorado. Hi, um, I'm Bob Amon. I work at Google um, in developer relations. Uh, my primary responsibilities are uh, actually social web and buzz, which is completely unrelated to what I'm talking about today. Um, John Woodell was originally scheduled to give this talk. He really wanted to be here, um, but unfortunately he had some personal commitments, so he uh, wasn't able to make it. Um, so we're going to be giving the talk instead. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, a quick, quick App Engine update. Um, there's some new stuff coming up in App Engine that we wanted to tell you about, uh, a lot of which is going to be very interesting, we think, to the Ruby community. Um, so um, the, the three main new things uh, are the channel API, the mapper API, and the namespace API. Um, channel API is really interesting. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with App Engine, but um, the way App Engine currently works is we, we have a, a time limit on all requests. Um, so you can't really have a request that lasts longer than 30 seconds. Um, so if you're trying to do stuff like comment or long polling, uh, that can be a real problem. So we're introducing the channel API as a way to deal with this. Um, it's an asynchronous server-client communication. Uh, it's bidirectional. Um, and we actually use the exact same technique in the, in the Google Talk client. Uh, so we're making that available to basically everyone who have, is, is using App Engine. Um, it's actually pretty easy to, to get up and running. Um, I'm showing the Java interface here, but it's basically the same idea if you're using Ruby, because you're just going to be uh, dealing with the JRuby interfaces. Um, so you have three methods that you have to define. Uh, create channel, send message, and parse message on the server side. Um, once you define these three messages, you can basically transmit whatever messages you need to, to the client uh, directly to the browser. Uh, and then on the client side, you have uh, a JavaScript API. Uh, you get yourself a socket, uh, and then on the socket, you can define events on open, on message, that will handle the uh, messages that, you, that you're transmitting back and forth to the server. And then there's the send uh, call as well, to send a, a message back to the server. Um, so that will let you do a lot of really interesting real-time stuff that wasn't currently, or that isn't currently possible in App Engine, and that will be coming soon. Um, we also have the Mapper API. Um, how many people here are familiar with MapReduce? Okay, fair number. Um, the Mapper API is the map part of MapReduce. Um, it is an open source project. Uh, it's actually live right now. You can go to mapreduce.appswap.com, assuming we actually have internet connections. Um, and you can see the project. It, it, there's uh, a branch for Python and a branch for Java. Um, and both of those are available now. Uh, we will be adding in the uh, shuffle and reduce steps of the MapReduce algorithm uh, at a later date. And that, that is coming soonish. Um, the whole project is built on task queues. Uh, and so when you go to uh, install the Mapper project into a Map Engine app, um, it's basically going to take advantage of all of the capabilities that are already in App Engine. Um, so that's, that's actually a very interesting project. And just as a, a diagram, um, this is the, the architecture of kind of how MapReduce works. You have a map step, shuffle step, and reduce step that allow you to do uh, very massive parallel processing on uh, distributed data sets. Um, and the part that we currently have available is the map step, which is basically the first part. Um, and in terms of practical usage today, uh, probably one of the better things that you can do with it is uh, basically changing your schema on the fly. So uh, the data store for App Engine uh, is it's, it's essentially schemaless. So you can have uh, a schema change after the fact. Then all the old data will still be using 
whatever your old, your old setup was. So now if you need to update all of that data to the new schema that you're using, you can do uh, a map uh, process and run a bunch, a bunch of jobs and workers to uh, realign your schema to what it should be. Um, and then we have the namespaces API, uh, which is a really interesting new technique. We actually kind of did something already. We've had it for a while in uh, Memcache, where you basically can set a namespace on your, on your keys. Um, but we're also introducing that for the data store and task queues and giving you a really clean way of uh, introducing those namespaces. So uh, that allows you to do data isolation. So for example, you can compartmentalize uh, information based on what user uh, you're currently looking at. You might want to seg segregate admin data away from the rest of your application. Um, potentially, you might have multiple environments. So like with Rails, where you have a production environment or a staging environment or a testing environment, uh, namespacing will allow you to basically run everything against the same data store, but then segregate the data uh, based on namespace. And potentially, you can even run multiple applications uh, in the same environment uh, without having them uh, colliding with each other. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Nick, and he's going to talk about Mira and Dubious. Okay. All right. So, so as Bob was talking about App Engine, so currently, um, you can there are a number of people running apps on App Engine using JRuby. Um, and uh, it worked pretty well, but it, it does have some limitations because um, JRuby is, is more dynamic than you know, like running something in Java, and uh, it has a larger runtime than running things on Python, uh, and it's not as it's not supported as well by um, Google because you know it's it's not like one of the primary languages for the platform. Um, it also uses a lot more. Uh, CPU time, which uh, since the way uh, App Engine is priced, uh, that means that um, it costs more to run uh, JRuby instances. Um, and if you want to get more performance, uh, uh, you need to write Java. So it costs more money. Um, uh, the kinds of things that uh, caused uh, John Wordle to want to, you know, start using Mira as a, um, a a language to build web applications with on App Engine, where situations like this, where you have these large spikes, and so you have to spin up a lot of instances, and if they're JRuby instances, you need more instances because um, because of the processing, uh, and so with Mira, you can you know it it's faster and it's a smaller runtime, so it, it's less expensive, and as I said on App Engine. CPU time is money, so um, that's kind of important. Uh, so the way that you, would, you used to be able to optimize your JRuby apps on App Engine would be to, well, you write an app in Rails, then you'd uh, take the parts of it that were hit a lot or um, slow, and then you'd rewrite those with Java servlets, and then maybe, maybe you'd have to host them on a separate app or something and access the same database. And it, it's kind of complicated and it kind of sucks. Um, and so that's where Mira and Dubious come in. So um, Mira, uh, which used to be called Duby, um, is, is a pretty cool language. Uh, Mira means Ruby in Javanese. Um, uh, Charles Nutter wanted to create a language that looked like Ruby, but um, was statically typed and compiled to JVM bytecode like Java does. And so that's, that's in a nutshell what Mira is. Um, so it uses Ruby syntax, uh, literals, and some typing stuff, but it behaves like Java, so it has a class model that's more like Java. Uh, and you can extend it through macros, uh, and you can write macros in uh, JRuby or in Mira. Um, so it has optional arguments, uh, closures, literals, uh, string interpolation, uh, and et cetera. So uh, for example, here's um, you know, a naive implementation of Fibonacci in Ruby. Um, in Mira, you just have to add pipe declarations to it. And um, it does a lot of inference to, so you can, um, you don't have to specify the type of every single variable uh, on assignment, it will do some of that for you. Um, it also has macros, so you can do things like um, 
you can iterate over a collection using each or um, uh, well, there are a number of other uh, helper methods like that. And uh, I think as the language uh, gets more evolved, there's going to be more support for writing your own macros and including them in your apps. Uh, so, dubious. Dubious uh, is a web framework in here. Um, so it's high performance, lightweight, and it's a lot like Rails. Um, so since it's written in Mira, it's about as fast as Java can be, or faster than some, I mean, like if you're using a large Java framework, it's faster than uh, that. You know, so if you're using like Hibernate or something. Um, uh, on App Engine, its instances spin up a lot, spin up very quickly. So uh, if someone hits a new instance with a request, because um, what App Engine will do is if you're getting more load, it will start automatically spinning up instances for you. Um, and uh, so the instances can be ready that much faster, which is, is very good. Um, it's also fairly lightweight. It doesn't, um, it, it's not like a, a big um, uh, Java framework with you know, thousands of files. And, um, and it, uh, it's not like JRuby, where it needs to load up a full runtime before, um, before it can start serving requests. <laughs> Uh, which is you know, part of why it's perf performant. Uh, and it's also um, so, you know, small footprint dependencies. So it's also kind of like Rails, uh, and it sort of was designed in a way so that it, it looks a lot like Rails. So here's an example um, of some dubious code. So it looks a lot like a, a Rails controller. You've got um, actions, and um, I'm using instance variables, and um, Mira looks up a lot like Ruby because it uses a very similar, and it works well actually the same syntax. Um, there are some differences though. So, um, because it's Java, you, you're importing packages, and um, and uh, some of the um, like niceties of Ruby using proxies and things are, are not there yet, and. Um, uh, in particular, one interesting thing is that the, um, the ERB things are uh, are m made using uh, functions. I mean methods. So um, so uh, how these are defined is that you use macros to define uh, the different views, and so you specify the name and then the, of, of the method you want to define and the location. Um, for models, it uses a framework that looks kind of similar to how um, data map works. Because, uh, uh, like Bob was talking about, um, uh, App Engine's uh, data store is schemaless, so you know you just define the properties that you want, and then um, uh, you're able to assign to them pretty easily. And it looks like you know, so it looks kind of like the data mapper, um, but it's a little bit different because uh, it's a different language and a different. Uh, so when, when you're doing templating, um, the, it, it's kind of the same kind of deal. So it's, it looks similar to Rails, but it's slightly different because of some of the, the, the differences between Ruby and Mira. Um, so I'll show you some examples, perhaps. And don't forget the, the cancer. Yeah. Move that over. Okay. So the, um, the stuff that I've been working on with this is mostly around tool chain issues. So I've been, uh, I've been working on trying to make it act a little bit more like how Rails does when you're building projects. Um, so you can do things like uh, dubious new, and that will um, generate an app skeleton for you, or blow up, depending on. <laughs> Uh, 
so <coughs> that's pretty much it then, I guess. Um, so uh, if you want to check out some of the code and things, there's, um, there's more information on Mira.org about Mira. And then if you want to look at Dubious, it's uh, on GitHub under Mira. Um, uh, the, there's also a, a couple of demo apps on, um, on appspot.com. So uh, Rails Annex is an example of an application that has both Rails and Dubious code running in the same instance. So um, like that's one of the, the upgrade path things is you can write, you can take a, a Rails application and you can take the, the controllers and models and translate them directly into um, mirror code and leave them more or less in the same uh, places in the, the application source structure, which is, you know, so it has a nice mapping to that. Um, you can also uh, check out the mirror mailing list. Um, Dubious doesn't have its own mailing list right now because it's kind of small. Thanks. All right, so um, I'm going to be talking a bit more about uh, Google APIs. Um, my primary responsibilities are actually on social web stuff, in particular Buzz. Um, and for the Buzz APIs, and actually some, uh, some of our other ones, uh, Latitude, Moderator, uh, and some, some upcoming APIs, um, we've been identifying some problems in the way that we've been designing our APIs. Um, in, in particular, we've been identifying maintenance issues with uh, how we're writing clients. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the, the things, the lessons that we've learned and how we are uh, correcting our past mistakes. Um, and also I'm going to go over some cool stuff that we have built uh, as a result of these lessons. So uh, first we've got some really cool Google APIs. Um, we've got some new Ruby libraries that we've built. Uh, there is a new Ruby API client and a command line tool. So uh, first, the problem is that we've got a lot of APIs. Um, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot. Um, and we've also got a lot of languages that we have to support. Um, typically, we'll support about five languages per API. Um, so when you're dealing with literally hundreds of APIs and five languages per API, uh, that turns into quite a lot of clients. Um, and a lot of those get out of date really quickly. Not every language gets the same amount of love. Um, in the past, Ruby has not gotten as much love as we would have liked to give it. Um, so we're trying to resolve that issue. And the way that we're going to try to resolve this is with uh, a new generation of discovery-based APIs. So the idea is that instead of writing lots and lots of clients, what we're going to do is we're going to write one client. Uh, we're going to have one Ruby client for all of our new APIs. Um, and that one Ruby client uh, will have basically pluggable parsers. Um, so, and, and potentially, we can even share formats across APIs. Uh, so that way, we can even have a single parser that will serve multiple APIs. Uh, so, for example, uh, one, one uh, format that we're supporting very heavily is activity streams. So we're building parsers for activity streams uh, that will potentially get used across multiple APIs. And because they can just plug into this one client, uh, our maintenance costs are, are much lower. And we can uh, do a lot more really cool stuff uh, to make the Ruby clients more mature and the parsers more mature. Um, so it's a big win for the Ruby community, and it's a big win for you guys. Um, the formats that we're using, I mean, there's, there's been, you know, a lot of work in the past uh, in this area. I mean, obviously, Wizzle, not the greatest thing in the world. Um, and also, there's Waddle, which is a much more modern uh, approach. But both of these are basically XML formats, which means that you have the overhead of the, all the parsing you need to do and uh, whatever additional steps you have to take there. Um, our approach is actually, it looks a bit more like this. It's built on JSON. It's actually, um, I mean, this is a big block of text and it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but um, it's actually fairly simple and easy to parse. Uh, simple enough that you can actually do it on a mobile client. Um, it's very similar to Waddle. 
uh, but as a JSON serialization. Um, it, like I said, it's, it's lightweight, it's easy to parse. Um, there's a much lower overhead, which is extremely important when you're trying to deal with a mobile client like the iPhone or Android. Um, and another interesting property is you can essentially pre-generate wrappers uh, that will allow you to, to bypass much of the overhead and the round trip of actually hitting the discovery endpoints. Um, and that's extremely valuable on mobile as well. Uh, for Ruby, in the process of building this client, uh, we discovered that there were a lot of uh, deficiencies, especially on the authentication side. Um, the OAuth gem that currently exists for Ruby is, sorry to the author, but not that great. Um, it had a lot of design flaws uh, that were going to be a serious problem with this type of a client. Um, in particular, we wanted to enable the ability to uh, essentially swap out the HTTP client that you use underneath. Um, so the idea is that you should be able to, if you're using Event Machine, uh, you should be able to swap in a client that will work with Event Machine, and that should just happen seamlessly. Um, if you're, if NetHTTP is good enough for you, then you should be able to use NetHTTP. Um, Additionally, I mean, we, uh, in order to enable this, we, be, we had to, to build a, an HTTP client abstraction as well. Um, and so that's also available as a gem. Uh, and then finally, we have the actual client itself and the command line tool that works with it. Um, so Signet is our new OAuth library. Um, it currently supports uh, OAuth 1.0, RFC 5849. Um, we're working very hard on OAuth 2.0, and, and when I say it's coming very, very soon, it's actually like my hacking project for the conference, so. <laughs> Ideally, I'd like to have it done by the end of the conference. Um, it's really clean. The interfaces are very tight, uh, well-defined, well-documented. Uh, we have an extremely thorough test suite. We're making sure that you know we, we really test this thing and make sure that we aren't having like regressions or any crazy stuff going on. Um, the HTTP adapter is really, really simple. I mean, it's like three methods. <laughs> um, and it, it essentially uses the rack uh, tuple spec uh, for representing uh, responses, and then uh, a quad tuple for requests, which is very similar to the format. Um, adding new support for new clients is really, really easy. It's like one new class and you're done. Um, and then the Google API client, uh, it is a preview release. Uh, we, we aren't quite recommending it for production use quite yet, uh, but it's, it's getting there. Um, and if you want to install it, that's gem install Google API client. Uh, it's open source. It, the official homepage is on code.google.com, but there's a, a, a f essentially a mirror on GitHub as well. Uh, shh, don't tell anyone at Google I did that. <laughs> Um, the Google API uh, command line tool is actually really cool too. Um, this is the, you know, the help screen for it. Um, it's got a lot of capabilities. It can do some really neat things. Uh, when you're debugging an API, when you're just getting started, you want to try out some cool new stuff. Um, you know, usually the first thing you want to do is you know, break out curl and go, okay, so what does this thing actually do? Um, but if you have an authenticated API, that can be really difficult. Um, because I mean, curl is just going to give you a 401 response because you didn't pass in the appropriate credentials. Um, and so in the past, we've actually used a tool that we call OA curl. Um, OA curl is a Java app um, that basically just runs on the command line and, and lets you pass stuff in uh, after <laughs> authenticating as, as a particular user. Um, however, it's, it's kind of error prone. It's really uh, Fiddly. Um, so we built this instead. Um, it has a, a couple of functions. You know, you can start off by uh, logging in as a particular user. Um, it also has the ability to, to access the discovery endpoints. Uh, so for example, you can list all of the methods available on a particular service. So like in my demo, I'm going to show uh, you know, a bit of basically how to discover uh, everything that the Buzz API can do. Um, it can then execute a method, pass in whatever parameters you need. And then when you go to write the code, you know, sometimes you just don't really care about the authentication piece. You just want to hack on some code. 
so we also have uh, an IRB command on the command line tool that basically just boots you up and gives, gives you a reference to a client object that's already had the authentication uh, piece all set up for you. Um, so I'm going to jump into a real quick demo for it. Um, Besides that, a little too big to fit on that screen. There we go. Make the font bigger. All right. So all right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to log in. With the buzz OAuth scope. <coughs> um, that's just a simple command Google API OAuth login, and you pass in the scope that you need. Um, and this will open up a web browser. And where'd my mouse cursor go? There we go. It'll open up a web browser. And you can see that it has already gone to the appropriate page. So I will sign in. All right, so you get the uh, the access screen. Click OK. Yes, grant access. All right, so now we're back here, and I'm authenticated. Um, and now I can do cool stuff like actually you know, the API calls. Um, so first we will. We'll list all of the posts that I've created. So you get back the JSON blog containing basically everything I've ever posted. Um, and you can see that it's actually personalized. There's some, uh, yeah, see the Google Buzz selfie for Bob in there. So it's, it's actually authenticated as me. Um, and then let's create an actual post here. So I am going to run this command. And I've, I've got a post.json file already set up. Let me just cat it real quick so you can see. So it's it's basically just a lit JSON post. Um, so I cat that in. I should get a response back. It basically contains uh, the response from the API. And now if I open up the top, you should be able to see. Post from the command line. Right there. The post we just created. Um, so I mean, the, you get a really, uh, a really clean, easy way to, to make API calls that are authenticated, um, and and that's the command line tool. So, um, whoops. One last thing I got to show before we run out of time here. Um, is the uh, IRB experience. So here we have a client object. Um, and it's actually already set up for us. We're already signed in, we're already authenticated. So you can just say client.execute. And I want to get activities list. Actually, I have it already in my buffer source. Well, so I activities that list, pass in the parameters that it needs. Um, I want JSON pretty printed, and you will get a back end there. Let me change this. Oh, I'm going to on here. I did not give the scope. So there's no scope parameter. <coughs> So, get it back in there. Uh, 
I have to, oh, insert. That's an insert. I need a list. That's one. There we go. So there's your content. Um, and it's the same content that you saw in that one. So anyway, uh, that's all we have time for. Um, and I'm going to hit our last slide so you can see where to take a look at this stuff. Um, you can fork the code on GitHub for any of any of those three projects, um, and these are the addresses where you can find stuff. Uh, if you just go to GitHub, Spark Monitor, they're the top projects. Thank you.